I'm excited to see everyone logging in. And we're just going to get started in a moment. Please feel free to join the conversation in the chat window. It's a really quite a fun way to um, keep up with everyone and where everyone is signing in from. I would like to remind you, though, that in the chat feature, there's a little toggle switch towards the bottom right where you above where you type. Please be sure to select everyone as the um, Zoom session tends to um, default to um, hosts and panelists. So if you select everyone, they, all the attendees would uh, will be able to see you. I'm getting a little distracted <laughs> by people saying hi to me specifically, but it's great to see you all joining in. I'd like to remind you as well that the um, Q&A box is the best way to ensure that we as the panel are able to see your questions. So do please direct your um, correct questions for the panel directly into the Q&A window. Um, you can engage with each other through the chat window as well. And um, it's just a fun way to keep up with everybody. So welcome to everyone to this first session of a five webinar series looking at climate action and social responsibility. I am incredibly grateful to Jackson Family Wines for sponsoring this series. It is really quite an important um, initiative that we're beginning today. And I am grateful to all of you who have been able to sign in and join us. The work that we're about to do over the next couple of months through this series is deeply important. As um, some of you know already, this is a decade for action. And in terms of climate change, this is a crucial decade for action. We're going to talk more about what that means today. And um, Jackson Family Wine's willingness to sponsor this series for the sake of greater understanding, education, and clearer communication for the entire wine industry is deeply important. As I've been saying for quite a long time, to make significant change, positive change, we actually need those with the capital and resources to stand up and take a stand. And so thank you to Jackson Family Wines for being willing to do that. I'm very honored to be doing this work. This is, um, as some of you heard in the press conference a few weeks ago, at the beginning of this year, I, just, I asked myself what I wanted to focus on in my work for the year. And I decided that for this year, there really is nothing more important than focusing on climate action and social responsibility as my two uh, most central um, initiatives and um, to select only projects that I really believe bring both of these together to further um, equity, to further um, the power of diversity, and to further resilience for all of us worldwide. And so that's my commitment for this year. And I've been willing to be part of this specific initiative because I believe that it very powerfully commits to both of those. This um, panel that I'm <laughs> somehow in the midst of is a little overwhelming because I have to say um, I'm deeply impressed and, and honored and quite humbled to be moderating a session with this particular group of people. Um, so to go ahead and introduce our panelists, I'd like to begin by introducing um, Gonzalo Munoz. Um, Gonzalo was actually selected by the Chilean presidency and the United Nations to be a high level climate champion. Um, as a result, he has worked to create global policy directly um, in relation to uh, climate change. He also co-leads Race to Zero, which is literally the largest initiative of, and um, collaboration, the largest coalition ever created in the world to bring together cities, regions, businesses, um, educational programs, and high-level investors to collaborate and make effective changes for the sake of climate action. He also previously um, founded Triciclos, which is a um, program beginning in Chile to help establish a circular economy based in recycling. And the success of that company has expanded it to 13 countries now, which is really quite significant. Um, and his own, uh, uh, he is also the co-founder of uh, a winery um, and small grower there in Chile, which was recognized um, um, internationally, I, I especially love the Syrah as a side note, but the um, one more note about Triciclos is that is actually, Gonzalo, my understanding is that it was actually the first um, business to be recognized as a B Corp outside of North America. Is that correct? That's right. Yes, yes congratulations on that. Um, now, Brian, uh, Brian, I just got nervous and blanked on the pronunciation of your last name, so I'm going to ask you to take care of that for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Christophic. Thank you. Brian Christophic, 
um, is the Director of Sustainability for Arda Glass um, Packaging here in North America. I'd like to point out though that Arda is actually a German co production company and um, has uh, plants here in, the, in North America as well. Part of what's significant about Arda is that it is um, committed as a producer to producing infinitely recyclable glass. And Brian's work is a, a very much based in the responsible implementation of uh, strategies and policies and practices that help to improve re these uh, recycling and reduce um, emissions as well. He's also a board member of Grass Glass Recycling Foundation, which is a nonprofit designed to help improve local and regional um, programs to improve the glass recycling supply chain. And so um, previously, Brian also worked on sustainability initiatives in other industries as well. And so he has significant experience in, in looking at how to make this work across multiple um, types of production. Uh, Julian Gevreau is the VP of sustainability for Jackson Family Wines. He's been working for more than 15 years in the wine industry and very importantly, across all aspects of the industry from production to marketing, operations and sales. Um, currently, he helps design and implement sustainability initiatives for Jackson Family Wine, but also really importantly helps um, hone in on best communication strategies as well, because the truth is that for these sustainability initiatives to work, we must all be getting behind them, and to do that, we have to understand um, what they're up to and why it matters, and so Julian helps solve that as well. He also has an MBA in sustainable management from Presidio Graduate School. And I'm very excited to um, also introduce Dr. Um, Kim Nicholas, who is the Associate Professor of Sustainability Studies at Lund University in Sweden. She's actually dialing in from Sweden today. She's the Director of PhD Studies at Lund University, the Center for Sustainability Studies there. And um, she previously actually did her PhD studies on the effect of climate change for the California wine industry. So it's like really a wonderfully, uh, wonderful synchronicity here between the speakers. Um, Kim has extensive experience working um, uh, in wine country, getting to know the effects of environment um, changes over time. Her work since, has, um, since getting her PhD includes more than 50 peer reviewed articles um, on climate and sustainability. And the effects of her work have actually been recognized in top publications around the world ever since as well. And very importantly, she's also the author of Under the Sky We Make, a book that we'll talk about a little bit today. I cannot strongly enough recommend this book. It is um, one of the challenges of climate research is how technical it can be. And I want to make sure everybody understands that this book is infinitely readable and it is um, an incredible opportunity to really understand what's at stake and what we can do. So keep that in mind. Okay, so I wanna go ahead and just jump right in, Kim, with you to begin with. And I, I mentioned briefly that this is a decade of action. Um, you know, one of the things we wanna focus on today is really this point that we need as an industry to accelerate the conversation to really bring the demand to be addressing climate action in every single choice that we make. Uh, media needs to be writing about it. Every article can link back to this question of climate action. Um, the trade needs to be researching producers um, and demanding changes from suppliers. You know, Producers need to be measuring their own emissions and figuring out how they can reduce them. But this point though, that it's a decade of action you know, one of the goals, the key goals is to cut global emissions in half by 2030. And um, I think for a lot of us don't actually know what that means or what what it takes to do that or why why that's so crucial. Could you so could you just get us started? Talk us through what's at stake there. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Elaine. I like to start with the really big picture, what everybody needs to know about climate change. And it almost fits in a haiku if you don't count the syllables too carefully, which is it's warming, it's us. We're sure it's bad, we can fix it. And this has been shown in thousands of studies. It's reaffirmed by the new UN climate panel report that came out a few weeks ago. And um, we're here today to talk mostly about we can fix it, but the reason we need to fix it is because the impacts we're seeing at just over one degree Celsius of warming 
are so serious and are so potentially threatening and further risks are really unacceptable and intolerable. So we really have to be focused on meeting uh, the terms set out in international climate agreements, which is to stop global warming as soon as possible. And those temperature limits are really critical for being able to, among other things, continue to have beautiful wines with a sense of place that we love and treasure. I grew up in Sonoma and have a big connection to that place. So for me, that's really important. If we wanna do that, we need to, as you said, globally, cut carbon pollution in half by 2030. And we've waited a very long time to do that, so we have to move really quickly. Um, the reason we have to do that is that we've almost used up all of our available, what's called carbon budget, so the amount we can emit of pollution and stay under these critical temperature thresholds. And we will not make it if we don't, uh, to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, if we don't get halfway there by 2030, it's just not gonna be possible, we'll be out of time. So we've got about a hundred months to make some really big changes. And the most important is going fossil free. I love the vividness of that point though. It's um, as Gonzalo was pointing out to us um, just before we started, we, we, you know, we have a nine year deadline actually but when you say we have 100 months, I feel like it makes it really vivid, but the count actually is. And so one of the things that you and I talked about previously was just the point that to decarbon, for any of us to decarbonize, we all have to decarbonize. And I think sometimes people get overwhelmed by that idea that, oh, I can't do anything because we all have to do something. So could you talk us through the tension of that? How do we how do any of us address that? Sure. Well, when we talk about decarbonizing, what we're talking about is stopping humanity, completely stopping adding carbon pollution to the atmosphere. And that is so important because some carbon lasts essentially forever. The lifetime of carbon pollution in our atmosphere is over 10,000 years. So twice as long as, for example, the pyramids have been around or Stonehenge has been around. This is a huge legacy that we're leaving that affects the possibilities for life on Earth and certainly for wine growing for, you know, all of humanity's future, basically. So the IPCC report, that UN climate panel report a few weeks ago was really clear to stop warming. It requires that we get to actually zero carbon pollution. We have to completely stop. And that's what decarbonizing will look like. Since most of our carbon pollution comes from burning coal, oil, and gas, we have to completely stop doing that. And as you said, we're part of interconnected systems as individuals, as consumers, as producers, but the whole system has to switch from away from the production and consumption of fossil fuels and towards sustainable and regenerative use of land. So, you know, I think we'll get into more of the details of uh, what some examples of people are doing, but what the research shows is that having somebody go and take the first step and start to do the work themselves can really catalyze action on bigger levels. It affects those around us if we're individuals and it affects supply chains and markets and bigger systems if we're part of organizations and companies. Well, because something I it's important to clarify that you've mentioned and you talk about in your book as well is just that I think sometimes people are like, oh, well, we're, we're really resilient. We can adapt. Humans are infinitely adaptable. But part of the point here is that past a certain point, adaptability is no longer enough. Can you clarify that a little more as well? That's right. With the amount of climate change that we have already experienced, the about one degree warming that's already occurred today, we know that we need some adaptation. We're seeing, for example, the fires in the Western US. We know that human-caused climate change has made those about twice as likely in the fall and throughout the West cover about twice as large an area. So yes, we need to adapt. We need to have more resilient homes, defensible space, and so on. But there are limits to adaptation. And we also need to focus on prevention of making things getting worse. Um, otherwise, what we see is that all our resources go into just adapting to worse and worse conditions. And those conditions won't stabilize and eventually start getting better until we actually get to the root cause of the problem and stop burning fossil fuels. So I think, yeah, go ahead. Well, so one of the things that's coming up in the chat that I'm going to directly argue against is some some people are saying it doesn't matter what we do because these other countries in the world are such bad um, behave have such bad behaviors that they're going to dominate and and ruin things for us anyway. And so I want to point out that that is not an acceptable response because we do have to take responsibility for our own choices and we do have to actually make demands of our own governments. So can you briefly talk us through again why does what we do matter 
and then I have a follow-up to that as well. Um, sure. Well, you're absolutely right on the country level. Um, climate pollution, the carbon pollution is cumulative. And about half of what's in the atmosphere now, so half of the problem to date, has been caused by the U.S. and Europe. So those of us with those histories certainly bear the responsibility for the majority of the problem today. If we're talking to uh, people who love and enjoy fine wines, this is certainly a, a niche and luxury market. And almost certainly most of us on this call are in the top 10% as individuals of emitters globally. So if the cutoff is if you make about $38,000 US a year or more, you're in the top 10%. And the top 1% is just over 100,000 US per year. So it's not just the Bill Gates who do have an extremely high carbon footprint, do fly 10,000 times more than average. But even those of us uh, who might be in the, the wine niche have a huge part responsible for about half of household carbon emissions. So our leadership does really matter as role models, as consumers, as investors, as members of uh, businesses and organizations and politically, we have a, an outsized responsibility for the problem and I think an outsized responsibility and really capacity to, to help solve it. Well, and I I think the US culturally, um, you know, as, as an American citizen, I'm gonna call out my fellow countrymen, but I think as, culturally as um, in the United States, we have a habit of blaming someone else. And your point that actually the United States, UK and Europe are so enormously responsible for emissions must be restated because we can't blame some other country we think has higher production levels. We're actually responsible. But I wanna go back to something you just said and um, that in a previous conversation with you had a huge impact on me actually. You made the point that, sm that actually minorities of people, so smaller groups of people actually have the power and regularly do change what we see as normal. So I think it's often the case that people assume we must have a majority, we have to get everybody on board. But you actually, um, in a conversation we had a couple of weeks ago, you, you mentioned that studies have shown that actually small groups of people actually do regularly change what we see as normal. So could you talk us through why that's relevant to climate change and what that means we can do? Yes, absolutely. It means that those of us who do care about climate, who all of us on this this webinar, have an outsized impact because as a member of kind of the first wave or early adopters or folks who are pushing forward, we have a really big impact. The study you're referring to um, was from University of Pennsylvania, showing that in this case, 25% of a population can change norms. So if there's a committed group of 25%, it actually does shift norms and that shifts the behavior of the whole group. So you don't necessarily need the majority on board. Um, more good news is that actually in the US and I know the data for, and I think similar in other countries, the majority of Americans today are concerned or alarmed about human-caused climate change. So sometimes uh, those on the other end of the spectrum get a lot of airtime. They're less than 10%. And we actually have a huge untapped pool of people who are uh, concerned or alarmed, want to be part of the solution, want to find pathways of how they can be helpful, and are ready to be part of this engaged group who is pushing for action and helping to reach this positive social tipping point that makes positive change happen. That's great. I um, I know too, like something that Gonzalo works so hard on is like helping to bring those people together and, and bring people in that really active, passionate role of wanting to help to make change and see change happen. You know, Gonzalo, you have been working on on exactly that at an international level. One of the things I really appreciate about what you do specifically is that you're really invested in bringing people from outside the government together to act um, towards climate change. And so I think sometimes people assume that these changes are supposed to happen only at the policy level, that the government is supposed to lead and make it happen. But could you talk us through why these collaborations between businesses, between investors, educational institutions, like how is that making the difference um, in our goal for 2030? Thanks, Elaine, and, and thanks to Jackson Family Wines for, for putting us together in such an important moment to, towards this uh, critical and urgent topic. Uh, yeah, first, I think that I, I love the, to uh, 
take take some of the elements that Kimberly brought and and kind of define this problem in a probably very simplistic way. Kimberly representing science is telling us that we have an illness and and our best potential cure and 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 and, and that that science is represented by the IPCC report with thousands of scientists uh, bringing us and repeating us the the problem and the cure and the treatment once over and over. The best possible cure that we have is increasing the temperature of the world 1.5 degrees, and that's in our hands still, if we do what the doctor is telling us to do. We have been a very stubborn patient in this case. Science has been, has been speaking for decades. And of course, as you said, Elena, we have somehow rely on governments to solve something that we know depends on ourselves and depends on the institutions that move our society and many times are capable of implementing solutions like the ones that we need for the climate crisis. And that means businesses, we know that businesses can change the lives of million people in, in a blink of an eye. We are talking about local governments that have the capacity on not only uh, moving the citizens, but also taking the knowledge of citizens and local communities and express that also to the global government. States, as, uh, as, as weird as it can sound, when it comes to negotiating an agreement, the California plays no role when, when it comes to signing the agreement. But we know the capacity that a state of California, mm -hmm. the, of the size of California has when implementing a, 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 a the, the, the needed solutions like this one. So when the governments reached the agreement in Paris back in 2015, for the first time, they recognized that those that are mostly capable of implementing an agreement like this one are those you, that you mentioned. Businesses, civil society at large, but mostly also local government and subnational uh, governments uh, li like the state of California, investors, they play an absolutely fundamental role when they play the role of placing the incentives for all of the sectors of the economy to get aligned, we know what happens. So what we did, uh, they, they, the nations, what they're, they're called the parties or the, the state members, they signed this agreement and recognized that we play a really important role. They allowed us for the first time to become part of the solution. And in order to do that, they created an agenda and ask for each of the countries that take the presidency of this body called uh, the Conference of the Parties mm -hmm. to name one person to run this uh, agenda. In this case, we have the particularity that both high level champions, me as the, coming from the presidency of COP from Chile and Nigel Topping, the incoming presidency of COP26, were both coming from the private sector. So we decided that it was time for running global campaigns aligned with science, allowing every, every non state actors to play a critical role on simply following what science, what Kimberly right. just said. Right. And so this is, so um, Nigel is the um, representative for the UK and you are the representative selected for Chile. And, and so we the play two, a role two by two. Yes. And so the two of you came together and you founded Race to Zero. And again, right. Race to Zero is the, largest coalition um, ever created of businesses, um, educational institutions, high level investors, um, cities, regions, as you pointed out, you know, the state of California is a great example. Our economy is bigger than most countries in the world. And yet we're not even represented directly in this conversation. So it's crucial that actually something like race to zero give a give away for these regions that can play such a crucial role to have access. But I know for you personally, you have actually taken a really strong um, commitment to agriculture, food and wine industries. So could you talk us through why is that sector of the global economy so crucial, which is essentially is our sector, right? Wine. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, every sector play a, a really fundamental role. As Kimberly said, it's first, about stopping emitting. So the energy sector transport have a very uh, critical role, but then consumer good products and, and, and pushing that sector towards decarbonizing the way we produce our products is critical. Also, 
not only as a moral duty, this is a matter of competitiveness. If you want to keep competitive in whatever you're doing, you must embrace this, uh, this goal. But then it's all about also increasing the capacity of nature to sequester that carbon back to the soil. And then there's, there's an inevitable path towards regeneration when it comes to understanding where we have to be, not only in nine, but then in 29 years, and then at the end of the century, we need to reinvent the way we produce, the way we feed ourselves. And therefore, it's all about positioning ourselves on the way where we can use the power of the farmers of the world that produce 80% of the food is produced mainly by small uh, holder farmers, the capacity of uh, and our knowledge, our, our technology towards not only producing um, our, our products, but also rest restoring the soil and its capacity of even sequestering carbon and its capacity of uh, restoring the water uh, mechanisms. All of that is now placed in what we call the race to zero 2030 breakthroughs. So now we have not only this vision on a race to zero by 2050, we have said also 30 sectors of the economy with its system transformation map on what needs to happen in each of the sector, meaning not only food production or wine production, also, of course, glass for Brian, and then cement, steel, aviation, transport, heavy duty. All of those sectors are now being mapped. And the good news is that we have seen how uh, what, what Kimberly was saying about how much of that transformation in each of the sector is happening. We use the Rogers curve, like when 10 to 2% of a sector embraces one certain technology or one specific goal, then the change becomes inevitable and you start seeing the exponential curve. We're seeing that being also one of the major sectors, the financial institution. Now we have more than $90 trillion being committed to raise to zero through the Glasgow Financial Alliance uh, to net zero. And that means that we, we will start seeing more and more investor mandating for this to happen in each of their investees all around the world. So the good news, and I understand that many people will say, no, we have to wait until those major uh, countries that are the big emitters or also commit. Well, let me tell you what is happening nowadays. The commitments, from the businesses, the commitment from local governments is changing the rules of the game as we saw in the United States during the last four years. It was, we are still in a coalition of non-state actors really carrying the backpack of the commitments of the United States. So that allowed the current president of the United States to take this agenda much higher where, than where it was when Obama left it. That is also being replicated as, as an example of what happened in the US is now being replicated in Australia, in Brazil, in Mexico, in Argentina, in Japan, in many countries of the world. And that power of the local communities, that power of the business is being perceived at the multilateral negotiations as the best possibility for really reaching the 1.5 degree world that we need to create. Yes. So I want to, I can see a bunch of stuff happening in the chat. I want to remind everybody that, um, you know, some of the issues that Gonzalo just mentioned about soil health and um, regenerative farming, we're going to be spending an entire session just directly digging into those questions and how they help with carbon sequestration in the third webinar session. So please remember some of those questions are going to be handled very directly and, and in depth at that time. But um, Gonzalo, your point though about, um, you know, like just like let's just break it down really quickly. Governments are motivated by their economy. That's simply true about how the world works, but the economy is driven by business. And so when bus the business sector makes powerful choices, it actually forces the government to change its policies in response. So we need to remember like small businesses actually, again, like going back to Kim's point you know, a few powerful um, people speaking up and businesses making commitments actually changes what our expectations are, change what we see as normal, and so then change what's possible. But Gonzalo, again- oh, And that, ahead. Elaine, that is described in the Paris Agreement, the Paris Accord, as the ambition loop. It exists as a concept, and we are seeing in several countries how that is happening and how businesses, as well as cities and, and investors, are helping the governments to enhance their climate ambition while 
implementing new NDCs. I think we need to create a t-shirt for everyone here today that just says member of the ambition loop. <laughs> like, right. uh, you we, know? Well, we have one that's, that's member of Race to Zero as, as, as Jackson right. family and, and Polcura, the winery that, that I co-started with my dear friend Sven in Chile is also an example. And, and we play Polcura, a small winery with Conchitoro as, 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 as uh, Jackson is putting together with the International Wineries for Climate Action many wineries that can and must play a role on reaching citizens of the world that while drinking a, a, a nice wine, you can be at the same time helping uh, this agenda move forward. But never forget that it's also about voting. It's also about purchasing in every, mm -hmm. in many, many ways. It's about using your talent in the best possible way and also managing the way where you can uh, influence through every type of relationship that you have. You, you must all of the power that you have as a citizen also as a customer. I'd love that. We are each individual, we are each individually influencers. We influence the circles we're connected to. We, um, we can bring that influence into every conversation we have and remember that our voting actually influences. We should be demanding who we vote for has already um, taken a stand on these issues. But I, I think though too that, um, you know, part of the point that you've been bringing up about how, um, you know, the wine sector has a unique position you were just commenting Gonzalo about like uh, while you're sitting there drinking wine you can actually be um furthering this conversation and Julian that's something that you and I have spoken about previously before too and I know Kim really says that too you know Kim if you don't mind me restating a line that you so beautifully said you know wine is climate change you can taste and Julian you have talked a lot about how you know the wine industry is uniquely positioned in agriculture you know so Gonzalo was just talking about how agriculture, food, and wine has actually a significant impact on global emissions. My understanding is 24% of global emissions comes from agriculture. And so the wine industry is uniquely positioned, though, in agriculture to really further the conversation and, and make consumers more aware. So Julian, could you talk us through in what sense, how is that, how is that the case? Why is wine such a unique um, player? Sure. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Elaine. And, and thank you, everybody, for um, for attending and um, panelists. Uh, thank you for for coming and, and giving this topic um, the airtime that it needs today. Um, I've I've been with Jackson Family Wines now uh, just over eight years and have really devoted um, my career and my life to um, addressing the climate crisis in, in my work through the business lens. And within the work that I do at Jackson Family Wines, um, it's it's really, um, and hopefully what you will see over the course of the next few webinars and, and masterclasses is that it is a holistic approach. And it's something that, that the company uh, across the board has really done amazing work over the last few years in particular um, to understand our impacts and, and work to lead um, through our influence and you know, foster these conversations. So I'm really looking forward to the next few uh, master classes and this one in particular with such an amazing uh, group of panelists. Um, also, Elaine, to, the, to the, I think your, your point on the chat, I've seen a lot of conversation around regenerative agriculture and there is a seminar uh, specifically devoted to that uh, on October 5th um, that will feature some folks on the farming team at Jackson Family Alliance and some really, really great stuff that we're doing there. So looking forward and, to- And um, some of the world's most respected plant and soil biologists as well. Yep, exactly. So, um, you know, I think one of the things that I see with wine and, you know, I'm a wine industry lifer. Um, I, I grew up in Sonoma County, grew up in the industry, um, spent kind of the first few years of, of my career after undergraduate um, school working on the marketing and communications brand development side, went back, got a, an advanced degree in sustainable management, and then moved back into the wine industry kind of from a operations um, and sustainability aspect. And I think, you know, my, my, my earlier history within the industry really helped me understand this deep seated connection that people have to wine. I mean, it's, it's, it's science, it's art, it's alchemy, it's, it's all of these wonderful things. And at the end of the day, it makes you feel really good to drink it. Um, and I think that there is this, this certain aspect to wine that, that really inspires people and excites people. And, as producers, um, what I've seen is the wine industry is unique within agriculture um, more broadly 
in our ability to speak directly to consumers. Um, people actively seek out um, a bottle of wine in a way that they don't actively seek out, you know, a, a, a container of strawberries, for example. And so as such, we have this, this direct link to our customers um, and kind of the world at large to really represent the work of, um, of agriculture across the, the climate spectrum. So, you know, I think that that puts us in a really unique place to be able to, to lead on this issue and to, to continue to, to really kind of cultivate these conversations and advance the discussion um, about, you know, as, as Dr. Nicholas mentioned, you know, what, what the, the challenges that exist, but also what we can do collectively as a group to, um, to address them from within our industry and influence um, broader, um, you know, organizations and, and governments across the board. Um, so something that we've spent a lot of time talking about though, is just the importance of transparency and accountability. And you also, in talks that you give on this topic, you, um, you'll often say, you know, um, forgive me, I don't remember your exact wording, but you, you can't, um, change what you don't measure. And so, um, you know, and what, and, and you, Kim, and I were able to, you know, meet in, in person outside socially distanced in the park a few weeks ago, but you, and you immediately handed over this chart, which was essentially, um, Jackson family wine as a whole company looking at its own impact footprint, its emissions across all aspects of the company. So one of the things I, I, when I speak with wineries that are interested, you know, Kim was talking about how actually most people really do care about this and do want to make a change. But the truth is a lot of wineries I speak to don't know what they should do to make the change. I think part of why everybody keeps talking about regenerative farming today is because this, that's the thing they can imagine they can do. But the truth is farming is not enough. So talk us through kind of what, what does that measurement process look like? And how are, how are you being transparent about that? And what, is, what does it mean in terms of the accountability question as well? Sure. So, you know, what, what Dr. Nicholas and, and Gonzalo were just talking about as it relates to, you know, the need for the global economy to decarbonize as quickly as possible with you know, significant um, steps taken between now and the next 100 months um, and then getting to zero by mid-century at the latest, you know, that has to be based for any individual organization in, you know, in their individual footprint and in their individual fact, right? So each of us as an entity and as an organization has a, what's known as a carbon footprint. Um, and there are ways in which one can go about measuring um, that associated footprint. And it, it accounts for um, essentially all of your direct activities. So these are called scope one and two emissions categories. So those are the things that you Within, within a business, we call it within the four walls, right? Those are the things that you emit as a company. Um, so right. it's- That you're directly producing. That you're directly yeah. responsible for. So it's the lights that you turn on, the electricity that you consume on site. It's the, um, it's the fuel that you use in, in your vineyards, um, things like that. Um, and then there are things on the other side of the equation called uh, indirect or scope three emissions. And we also call those supply chain emissions. And that's everything that you as an organization kind of create demand for. So you're not necessarily creating the emissions yourself, but you're creating the demand for those things. And that's things like transportation, packaging, um, you know, the uh, business travel, things like that. And generally speaking, you know, most organizations have a significantly larger scope three footprint than they do scopes one and two, because that just speaks to the, I think that the, the, the interconnectedness of global supply chains. So, when we were setting out, you know, how we needed to approach climate um, and our and develop a climate strategy, we recognized from the very, you know, early outset that we needed to 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 measure in order to manage, like you said, Elaine. And so, taking some globally existing protocols and, and understanding, you know, that there are ways in which you can measure your footprint um, appropriately and understand where your impact areas are and where your focus areas should be based on that, that area of impact. So we've been doing that since 2008. Um, and we've seen a lot of, um, a lot of amazing, you know, a lot of really interesting things kind of came about uh, as a result of, of us understanding the footprint, because it really told us and helped us understand where 
we needed to focus our efforts, what the things were that, you know, we could, the levers that we could pull that were in our immediate control, we call that, you know, a lot of that stuff is called the, the low hanging fruit, right? What can we pick uh, early to, to start moving our, our carbon footprint in the, in the right direction in line with what the science is saying. Um, and where we're, I think, going now is we're recognizing that, you know, we are a player in a much larger space. And so um, what we want to, um, to really raise and to really accelerate across the industry is how we as an industry can work more closely in a collaborative kind of pre-competitive sense to um, advance decarbonization efforts across the wine industry as a whole. Well, and so Julian, you've been instrumental in forming another international collaborative effort, International Wineries for Climate Action. And one of the things I love about that is just the recognition that, okay, you know, there are these various companies, um, various wineries that fall under the umbrella of Jackson Family Wines, but actually if you can get lots of wineries to join together um, and make these same commitments to science-based initiatives, that immediately your case count, to put it simply, is much higher, which means you can, as a group, leverage the supply chain, which we're gonna talk about more in a minute, to help decarbonize everyone else as well. And, um, and I know, um, I believe IWCA, International Winery for Climate Action, you know, you do a lot of work advising um, smaller wineries as well. And actually, while we have you here, Gonzalo, I'd like to actually also bring you back in on at this point, you know, Gonzalo, you know, it's one thing to have a company like Jackson Family Wines talking about, oh, well, we're making all these initiatives. And some, sometimes, again, it's easy to let ourselves off the hook by saying, oh, well, they have, they have the means and resources, so they should do it. But Julian just pointed out, there's lots of low hanging fruit. There's lots of little things that can be done and that actually adds up pretty quickly. But Gonzalo, so for a smaller winery, you know, you and Sven have Pokura, what are, what's some advice you have for smaller growers, smaller wineries that can make a difference as well on these questions? There are, uh, one is a very pragmatical one, I would say for us, for example, we, we work in a, in a region that's, where the draw is, is hitting very hard. So really embracing and, and carrying the flag of dry farming represents a great opportunity of learning and, and, and really uh, positioning your wine with many, many uh, characteristics that, are, that will differentiate you in the, in the shelf with, with the conversation with customers and critics. And, and definitely something that I encourage every uh, winery to explore in, in those places where we're mostly using irrigation as, as a normal practice. But then it comes to energy. It's like, it, it's actually absolutely dumb not to be producing your, your own energy with renewable. I mean, there's no reason whatsoever. I'm, and, and that represents a possibility of, again, uh, reducing your cost, being sustainable, uh, but of course, adding an, an extra value to how you produce uh, your, your wine. Then there comes to another element of restoring the soil and working with biodiversity also represent value for the brand, represent value for, uh, for the, the, the richness of your property and def definitely represent an opportunity on adding value to your value pro proposition. Finally, it's about sustainability as a whole. There are so several social elements that you should also take into consideration. That's why we're carrying the, the B Corp certification as, as the way we understand every business should be driven. And that also opens many other conversations. As you said, you can, you can uh, taste climate through wine. I don't know, the phrase was brilliant, uh, but then wine is a great way to open different types of conversation. And we do both, right? We take sustainability and we take very serious the need of having purpose through the wine, but we also use wine to open different types of conversation that we think we need to take into consideration now, also for the value proposition of what we are putting into the glass. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, and Julian, you, um, I know the membership of IWCA continues to expand, but there's some initiatives that that um, International Wineries for Climate Action are working on to help make it easier for wineries to do this work themselves. Are you able to talk about some of those a little bit? Sure, yeah. So uh, just a high level introduction about um, International Wineries for Climate Action or IWCA. Um, it's a working group that uh, the Familia Torres of Spain and Jackson Family Wines uh, co-founded in 2019. 
Um, and our overarching objective was really to, you know, help the wine industry, you know, take a position on climate change by, as I mentioned, measuring what matters. So when we came together, we recognized that we needed to um, start from a, a starting point of understanding what, what our emissions were. And Jackson Family and Familia Torres had been, you know, measuring our individual organizational footprint since about 2008. We compared notes and, and ultimately came together with uh, the recognition of, you know, what what, what needed to be done in order to develop, uh, you know, standards for managing to measure or measuring to manage. And um, so we ultimately created this group that was focused on this robust measurement and verification of our greenhouse gas emissions so that we could participate in uh, initiatives like the UN Race to Zero, which IWCA joined officially in April of this year. So all IWCA members uh, are now members of Race to Zero as a, as a function of their um, their membership within IWCA, um, but also just then we can start aggregating and getting a better understanding of what the organizational um, and what the industry footprint looks like. So um, I, I think one of the first things that we recognized very early on is that it is complex, it is complicated, it is time consuming, and it is expensive to do, you know, a robust greenhouse gas emissions inventory uh, that is essentially required to, 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 to ultimately understand where your, where your baselines are and where you need to focus. And, you know, it was something that Jackson family and, and Torres had been doing for a number of years and we had all spent pretty considerable expenditures on that. And we recognized that in order for this organization to grow, we needed to find a way in which smaller wineries could, could take a, a similar approach um, and, and hit that level of robustness, but, you know, do it with limited resources. So, we spent a lot of time uh, over the last six, eight months to develop a calculator tool that, um, that any winery can use. Um, so we started with a US-based tool that's available to any winery within the United States. And, um, and that's already and ultimately, available, right? It's available, exactly, yeah. yep. And so it's calibrated to the United States with US-based emissions factors. We're working on calibrating one in Australia and New Zealand next. And uh, Europe, I think, will be the third one uh, with South America being fourth. Um, but that has, I think, appealed to a lot of the small to medium-sized wineries that we've spent a lot of time talking with over the last few years who have said, hey, we really want to take action. We really want to participate in this, but we just, we don't have the resources to commit to it. So having a tool like the calculator tool that we developed, I think is really valuable in the sense that it helps people, you know, have a degree of robustness with their reporting um, that aligns with international standards. And you know, is also something that can be done pretty much in-house um, with, with, you know, existing personnel, existing resources. We've got some organizational support that, uh, that we can add from IWCA standpoint. Um, but I think then the bigger opportunity is we look to grow IWCA. Um, and we, we currently have 10 members um, in our ranks uh, who are full standing uh, members within IWCA today. And we have another nine or 10 that are gonna be um, announced in a couple of weeks uh, that are joining as well. Um, and I think that speaks to, you know, the opportunity for the industry to come together um, and to really advance and have these conversations and advance solutions and work with our supply chain partners at large, talk to each other about the challenges that we're facing on everything from regenerative agriculture to renewable energy um, and, and really kind of chart a path forward as a group as quickly as possible because, you know, we've got a hundred months to, to, to do a lot of work. I think the point that we can only succeed competitively if we're collaborating um, for success is really crucial. And so, you know, Brian, I'm, I'm really, to be blunt, I'm really impressed and grateful that you're here. You know, um, the truth is that in the wine industry, glass takes an enormous beating in terms of criticism, but I'm going to make a really basic point that I think is often overlooked, which is that when it comes to fine wine um, and actual aging and development of wine and the quality of the packaging, the truth is there isn't anything better than glass. If we want to, um, if we want to actually hold for 10 years a, a bottle of wine that we know will only get better with age, we do need an inert container like glass, and we're not going to um, age first growth Bordeaux in cardboard, to be blunt, or um, burgundy in a keg. So we, we, um, that means that we have to actually find viable solutions for, for actual glass and to how, how on earth, to be 
to, to the point, like how on earth are we supposed to reduce um, emissions with glass production? I think that the wine industry has struggled and assumed there is no way to do that. What I appreciate about Arda and your work with Arda though, is that you actually are um, collaborating with other glass companies from across Europe and coming up with solutions for emissions. So could you talk us through kind of that point, like for, for us to reach the 2030 goal of half emissions by 2030, zero by 2050, we have to be actually demanding change across the entire economy, which means supply chain as well. That means producers have to leverage their buying power to cause change for suppliers, but suppliers also have to in turn provide materials and the technology so that producers can get there too. So the two things have to happen together. So talk us through like how, you know, how is Glass doing that? How is, how is Arda doing that um, in changing its practices and, and, and working with um, producers to do that. Sure, sure. Uh, thanks, thanks, Elaine. Um, you know, I know that um, you know Julian mentioned that scope three emissions typically are are larger than your scope one and, and two emissions, and, and and we represent some of the scope three emissions for uh, you know Jackson family. Uh, you know, in uh, in Europe, you mentioned the collaboration between several glass companies. Uh, Feva, who's the European uh, Glass uh, Packaging Producers Coalition, has uh, uh, started a project called the Fur uh, Furnace for the Future. Um, that began around 2018, and uh, this is you know, co-funded by a number of the large 19 uh, uh, other large glass producers in, in Europe. Where, uh, you know, when we're looking at melting glass in the glass production process, taking about 60% of the direct emissions out of that process by using less fossil fuel-based gas and more electricity, which can come from renewable sources. Um, and so, you know, the, the Furnace for the Future is something that's been submitted to the EU Innovation Fund for funding. Uh, it's a project that's being uh, piloted at one of our plants in, in Germany, but is co-funded again. Um, and, and with the, the, uh, the knowledge that would, would go to several wine producers, all of those, uh, not wine producers, I'm sorry, glass producers in Europe, uh, once that gets proven out. So that's really a, a game-changing technology that... Um, you know, I think that is, uh, is, is seen as being something that needs to be taken across the industry and something that, uh, you know, where we can look at less of a fossil fuel intensive uh, uh, production process and uh, using more of the renewable assets, as Gonzalo mentioned, that we have uh, to produce energy. Well, and so I want to highlight some, a couple of things you just said. So it's 20 glass producers across Europe have actually combined forces to share technology and resources. So again, to compete, we have to collaborate. This is Furnace for the Future is such a great example of this. Um, glass producers are actually sharing the technology to reduce emissions in glass production. But I wanna point out though, that um, something you told me in our previous conversation was that we actually already know how to make zero emissions steel, I believe you said. Right, yes, SSAB in Sweden actually, um, uh, has created that fossil fuel free uh, steel product. So that is with, uh, you, you know, uh, the, the, the steel melting process, it, you could think of it like the, uh, the, the glass uh, production process in terms of uh, using, using, uh, using a lot of, of natural gas and uh, that is a fossil fuel. And so hydrogen represents a, a major opportunity as a power source uh, that, that, that we see kind of starting in Europe where we have more of a base of renewable electricity as the, as the best opportunity. And uh, you know the goal is to, to move that towards the United States as well. Right, I mean, one of the things we have to point out though is that policy does play a crucial role. The EU actually has um, um, a bigger base of renewable energy across Absolutely. the board, right. but is also um, putting a lot of funding into renewable en energy, which thereby makes it affordable for businesses and consumers as well. And um, so Furnace for the Future is, is taking off in Europe first because the policy and the infrastructure and resources are there for that. One of the other things though that, that you help me better understand that I think is um, kind of blows my mind, but so when we use recycled glass to make new glass, that significantly reduces the emissions in the production of that glass. So could you talk us through just like how that works and what we need to know about that part of the process? Sure. Yeah, you're, 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 you're right. When you use, when you recycle a glass bottle and glass is infinitely recyclable, you, you are, um, uh, you know, giving it, not only giving, giving the glass a new, a, a new life, it can be used in the production process, but the more glass that we use, which is called cullet, uh, 
in our furnaces when we're when we're making the glass along with sand and soda ash and, and limestone materials, the more the more uh, recycled glass that we have, the lower emissions are, are are generated from making that exact same product. So about a 10% increase in the recycled content that we we um, that we use in terms of recycled glass can reduce uh, our emissions by about um, uh, you know three four percent, um, and as well as some of the the sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides as well that are that are part of that. So um, I, I, I that that's something that that I think is is, is really important when we look at um, you know the, the glass as a product that um, one is uh, you know from recycled material, but also after you know you consume something and and uh, dispose of it, it can be used again and again. So that's part of the circularity concept. So we're not just looking at post-consumer material as part of the product, but it's a post-consumer material that can be used again and again. And that's where we see uh, the importance of recycling and uh, and reuse coming in. So uh, yes, I think you know the more glass we can use, uh, the the more efficient our furnaces uh, will be. The longer the lifetime is, the fewer emissions. And uh, it's, it's, it can be a real business benefit as well as the right thing to do. Right. So one of my huge frustrations in, in researching this program is discovering that, um, you know, the EU actually has a really high proportion of um, recycled glass, but it's also because the entire system, like recycling is a way of life. There's right. literally recycling, multi-stream recycling programs all over Europe. You go back to the, your retail shop and then you put yellow glass, green glass, blue glass. It's all taken care of, which right. gives a cleaner product to then go to be recycled. The United States has comparatively low recycling rates, but it's also because there's literally the recycling programs don't really exist here. They're single stream. We put all the same stuff in together. That means you get a very dirty product, so to speak, from the glass that's being recycled. But you did mention that in, in communities where there are glass deposit programs, recycling rates are higher. So could you talk us through some of those basics of like how policy actually can improve um, the recycling programs and thereby also lower emissions in that way? Yeah, you know, I, I would say, you know, in, in the United States, our, our glass recycling rate is about 34%. So 34% of all of the waste that's generated um, Compared to uh, what in the EU again? Uh, about seventy percent of of that glass is is recycled and ends up back in the in the production stream again. Um, and so, you know, I think we, we've seen some great strides in the last twenty five years in Europe, increasing about twenty five percent in their recycling rate of glass. And in the U.S., it's it's it stayed the same. So, one of the points you mentioned there about the single stream recycling um, and single stream recycling is when you put all of your recyclables in in one bin for collection. That, that concept has made things easier for consumers, but creates more difficulty on the processing of your recycled materials and getting back to a producer uh, in, in a cleaner fashion. So when it's just a, a deposit system and someone returns their ten, deposit for 10 cents at the store or five cents, um, you know, we're getting full, we're getting you know, empty glass bottles with less other mixed in items that come from a single stream recycling source where uh, the, the, the glass is crushed along with, with cardboard and paper and maybe some stone or other ceramic items and things like that. Brian, that can really, I just ask just you to pause idea. just briefly? Sure. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but, um, so Gonzalo Munoz actually does need to go. Um, I want to point out though, it's actually because as a high level champion for climate change, he's actually on his way to a meeting um, for the United Nations. So uh, you uh, fitting in an hour of your time between uh, giving a climate change presentation in Austria earlier today and now going to a global meeting um, planning the, the next climate change conference uh, for the United Nations. It's an incredible honor to, to have you here. Um, I'm, I'm genuinely humbled and honored that you made this time for us. Thank you so much for um, for sharing this information with you. Andrew Chalk likes to be very controversial and I will point out that no, um, Gonzalo is doing these uh, meetings by Zoom. So um, th again, Gonzalo, thank you so much for-, for Thanks so much, Eleni. Uh, and again, to Jackson Family Wines and look forward to continue bringing more wineries to Race to Zero. We'd love to be able to support any doubt. And, and, and of course, uh, uh, we will we will hopefully have a successful COP in Glasgow where we'll be able to show how this agenda, the the 
again, the businesses, the financial institutions, the subnational governments have the capacity of implementing what is required. So again, thank you, Eleni, Julian, Kimberly, Brian. It was a pleasure. Stay well. Thank bye -bye. you so much. Thank you. Um, so Brian, again, my apologies for um, interrupting you, but um, one of the things though that you and I talked about was that, again, so on, what you're, as you're describing it, in the United States, we essentially have single stream recycling, which means no. like all our paper, you know, all our plastics, all our glass, we all put it in one bin. And that, you know, the idea is um, the United States has a very low compliance rate on almost any change that ever happens ever. And so we're like, okay, if we make it easy, that'll help. The downside though, is on the, at the back end, as you were saying, um, the glass that the recycling um, producers get ends up having a lot of other things mixed into the glass. So rocks, stones, ceramics, right. papers, and that actually makes it much harder to recycle that glass. One of the solutions you and I talked about though, is that retail um, businesses have an opportunity here to motivate their customers to bring, when they go back in to buy new things, they can bring their, gl their glass bottles with them. And so if a retailer was willing to be a receiving station, essentially, that would create a unique recycle stream just for glass. And then you had mentioned that a re retailer could solve this by then getting in direct contact with glass recycle um, businesses in their region. But here in the United States, you said that there is a primary one um, that especially would be useful to contact. Could you tell us more about sure. that? Yes, yeah, uh, strategic materials is one of the uh, the larger uh, glass processors in, in in the country here, and they uh, do a great job of you know not only working with a lot of the uh, the recycling and waste haulers or the companies that that gather from commercial or, or, or residential uh, you know places uh, to to get the glass and process it and clean it, but they also work with those smaller cities. Um, and, and larger cities, even uh, as well as well as as uh, you know, businesses that um, they can take those glass bottles directly that are returned at a store or at a community recycling center, and that um, provides a much more cleaner, uh, easier to process uh, glass product. Because you know, when we melt glass in our furnaces, if there are rocks or ceramic, it's it's bad news for um, you know the, the 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 quality of the product and the consistency of the product. So, uh, yeah, there are you know opportunities for some communities where glass recycling has been taken out of a recycling glass has been taken out of a recycling program for um, you know counties or even businesses to to be a be a site or a central lo location where consumers uh, can come and, and return those products. And, you know, you mentioned those bottle bills uh, earlier or bottle deposit states. And we see about, you know, twice, uh, twice as much recycling in those states as we do in, in um, states that don't have those, those bills. So it's not only the behavior of getting, of, of, uh, of getting your money back, but I think also when you interact with the system and see that I'm taking this bottle and it's going back and it's, you know, I feel more, more certain that it's going to be, uh, be mm -hmm. recycled and reused, that that really engages people to feel like they're making a difference more. And so California has about a 67% recycling rate, uh, which was which is great. And I think obviously helped by the, uh, the deposit loss that are there. But uh, that's that's something we see that, um, you know, is very effective, um, you know, absent a, a widespread system of, of, of deposit returns, uh, you know, at retailers, um, those, uh, those bottle bills work well as well. Yeah. So a lot of this comes down to motivating consumers to participate. Um, some of that comes down to making it easier, but also just showing that, no, this really will have a, ha be taken seriously. The glass really will be reused, but then, and then in some cases giving rewards, just very basically giving rewards. The other thing that needs to be addressed though, when it comes to glass is the, is the weight of glass bottles. You know, Jancis Robinson in the last few years has really become a media champion for calling out the wine industry on the, the heaviness of glass bottles. Um, historically, it's been a prestige move that a heavy bottle really is, you know, a great bottle of wine. It even weighs a lot, you know, but the truth is that when it comes to emissions in the glass, in glass, um, the effects of glass um, in the economy, we need to think in two sides. So one is the literal production, which we've been talking about. So the emissions created by producing the glass, we can lower those right. through recyc increasing recycling. We need to actually improve our recycling programs to do that. But also furnaces for the future are um, working on creating 
um, low and zero emission furnaces so that by using renewable energy as you described. But then on the other side, um, and Julian alluded to this earlier, really for most businesses, especially in the wine industry, the bigger carbon impact rather than it being what's contained within the business itself, it actually comes from transportation of goods, right? So the transportation of glass is the other piece of the emissions question. So production on the one hand, transportation on the other. And the way to, re there are multiple ways to reduce the transportation emissions, but one of those is light weighting bottles. Um, and so, and Arda has actually worked on creating technology and doing thoroughgoing studies to determine like the lightest weight bottle possible, so to speak. But it, demand, it, it depends on producers actually requesting that and if really importantly on the trade demanding it. So can you talk us through that process of like light weighting bottles and why that has such a significant impact for emissions? Sure, yep. Uh, um, you know, I think as you mentioned that it's it's something that we work with our with our customers on and needs to be, you know, needs to come from that uh, demand side. So without, you know, with, uh, sacrificing any of the safety or the, the form function of, of, uh, of the container, really making sure that, you know, even if, if we get a few percent of, of, of weight out of a product, that has a tremendous impact on, you know, using less materials to make a bottle, but also having lighter, uh, uh, you know, lighter load to, to transport and using fewer emissions in terms of the, the, the transportation uh, to, um, to uh, you know, further down the value chain. So, uh, you know, it's something we do through, you know, computer aided design and, um, you know, we have a whole series of, and uh, I know other glass producers do too, I, I believe of, of, of what we call our eco series bottles that are, that are of lighter weight and uh, something that we, we can collaborate with, uh, with our customers of, of, of getting the, the aesthetic that they would, would, would like, but using less material, which often, you know, which will, will help our business, help lower emissions and, and make transportation uh, less expensive and less onerous uh, on, the, uh, on the other side. Right. And a lot of, again, you know, something that Gonzalo mentioned earlier was just the point that this is not just a moral imperative. It actually makes good business sense to be making these decisions and these changes. But one way the rest of us can actually participate in, in this kind of positive change is to very simply demand lighter weight bottles. Um, you know, I know um, there's a lot of questions coming in about alternative packaging as well. But before we get into that, Julian, um, both Kendall Jackson brand wines and La Crema brand wines have actually made the commitment to um, use these um, lighter weight bottles. And, and I recall that you mentioned it's had a significant um, impact because, again, you are measuring all of these impacts, right? So light weight exactly. bottles has, has significantly reduced um, the footprint for these brands. Could you talk us through that a little more? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that was the thing that, that you know, when we were looking back in 2015, you, you know, at the levers that we could pull now um, and the actions that we could take immediately, that, that low hanging fruit, you know, after reviewing our, our emissions inventory, we recognized that um, we had, you know, uh, glass bottles were, a, a, they were a pretty decent sized contributor to our emissions footprint. And the levers that we could pull were, you know, increasing recycled content of the bottles, um, which is kind of out of our hands. And we were fortunate enough to be in a region where, you know, the, the, I think the, the recycled content in our bottles is above 50%. Um, so that's a, that's a good number. And I think it skews better than the vast majority of the rest of the United States. So that was kind of a, a win for us that, that, you know, was just fortunate based on geography. But the other more immediate thing that we could do is we could reduce the, the weight of our bottles. And um, so for Kendall Jackson and for La Crema, we pulled, I think, three ounces out of, uh, out of each of those bottles. Um, and it was a long process whereby, you know, there was a lot of back and forth um, with our marketing team you know, in particular to kind of really, they were curious to understand, well, are we going to, you know, is, are we going to cannibalize our, our market share? Are people going to think that our, that our wines are cheaper? Um, you know, Elaine, this gets back to the whole kind of chicken and egg conversation about how we in the wine trade have, have spent so much time working on, you know, the, 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 the concept that better wine comes in heavier glass bottles. And ultimately um, we made the shift and we, um, we were able to, to, you know, to, to recognize, I think about 4% uh, emissions reduction 
in our uh, our footprint kind of just right off the bat. But that's your that total could, footprint, right? Correct. Across four, the across so our four percent. Yeah. Let me let me just, highlight this four percent total emissions reduction. Yeah. Just from light weighting the bottles. Just for, from pulling a small lever. Yeah. 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 And that incorporates all the, the transportation related emissions associated with the glass because it's lighter and whatnot. And you know, we kind of held our breath as we introduced these wines into the marketplace and we didn't, we didn't uh, talk about it um, on purpose because we didn't want to, we just kind of wanted to see what would happen. And, um, and ultimately, you know, nothing happened from a consumer perception standpoint. Meaning I think they just, they just made the change with you. Meaning people, yeah, still bought the wine. Um, and so, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't any discernible impact to, to sales. And, and ultimately, you know, I think that gave us confidence that we could continue to, you know, that's a lever that we can continue to evaluate and to pull. But to the point that you made earlier, Elaine, I think having a cover, I guess, maybe that's not the right word, but maybe it is from people in the media and the trade who are also saying like, hey, you know, this is something that that we can pull and we can we can work on together. And this is an important issue that that is impactful based on what we know because of what we're measuring. I think that that really underscores, you know, the actions that we can take. I mean, the other one that we that we invested in early on, and, and it you know it speaks to the kind of the business side of sustainability and understanding where you can pull levers and you know uh, and, and and drive you know operational savings is renewable energy. So in 2014, 2015, we built uh, what is today the largest um, solar on-site solar generation portfolio in the American wine industry. We installed about 23,000 solar panels, seven, seven-ish megawatts, um, which for us produces about 30% of the annual electricity uh, that we use every year for um, our winemaking operations. And, you know, the, the, that had a, a pretty significant effect in reducing our, our total carbon footprint somewhere in the neighborhood of about five to 7%. Um, and it also was an incredibly smart business decision because we insulated ourselves from, um, you know, all the increases in, in electricity costs that I think all of us in California have seen as a result of um, the wildfires and, and everything else that's been going on with PG&E, the local electric utility. Um, but recognizing that, you know, we could make these investments, that they were good for the business, they were good for the bottom line, and they were the right thing to do from a climate perspective, you know, those types of activities, those types of investments, I think are what really give us hope that there is a path forward and we can all be, you know, working together to amplify this work. Uh, one of the questions that keeps coming up in chat and um, has also come up in the q and I, I believe Eric Asimov wrote an article about reusable bottles. Gabriella Fontanesi is asking about it in um, the Q&A as well. And, um, and so one of the part of what people are wondering is like, okay, well, if we're willing to take bottles back to recycle, why don't we just reuse them yep. to be really plain about it? Um, you know, it might be a nice long-term goal, but if you, if I just ask every wine drinker in the, ch in the chat to just go look at the wines in their own collection, every, every bottle is, is, every bottle <laughs> is different. Um, yep. and be, without consistency of bottle type, it is impossible for bottling lines to really effectively, um, re-bottle with those bottles. Also think about the storage required to reclaim bottles and keep them from breaking. The nice thing about recycling glass is the glass can break and still be recycled. It cannot be reused if it's broken. Um, and then, um, there's also just, you know, the cleaning question is the, probably the easiest thing to take care of, but we were already pointing out how difficult it is to get recycling going in the United States. So imagine how monumental it then becomes to reuse. So does anybody else have on the panel though, have other resources? Uh, no, I mean, I would say it, that's not to say that we shouldn't be evaluating yeah. and exploring these things. Uh, Jess Jackson actually um, invested in a, a bottle reuse company, I think 10 odd years ago. Um, and it, it was, I think probably ahead of its time. Um, and uh, needless to say, nobody here has probably heard of it. So that means it didn't, it didn't work out. Um, but I, I will say that, you know, we have, um, and Betsy Andrews just posted something in the chat, uh, an article that she had just written, which is a really, really great compendium of kind of the alternative packaging options that are on the market right now. And, you know, I think all of them are worth continuing to explore and continuing to support because, um, you know, there's not a one size fits all solution for the industry. 
Well, and so um, Ali is asking about the just the idea of, you know, it seems like a next step um, form of collaboration would be to get the industry to agree on a single yeah. wine bottle mold. Um, Brian, I think you're a good person to address the challenges of, of coming to those agreements. There are, though, we should remember in Europe, there are Appalachian bottles. Um, there have been a couple of attempts here in California to create Appalachian bottles, you know, that does kind of streamline recycling for sure. I haven't seen it effectively lead to reusing, but Brian, do you have any comments on that? Uh, well, I, I know we do see reuse in, in, in some industries, the milk industry, for example, uh, where that's been a standard practice for, for, for a long time. Um, and I, I, I think with the common molds, you know, I think what, what we see is sometimes the packaging is, a, is, is kind of a differentiator or representation of a, of, of a brand. And so a lot of those decisions, uh, you know, come down to um, the look and feel of the product and, and kind of consistency with brand. But, you know, if, if something was, was done around standardization, I, I think that would, um, you know, be, be something that we could, we could look into and that uh, would be an effective thing, but it's, it's, uh, you know, something that, um, Again, across the industry, uh, in and looking at competing products, it could, it could be difficult for for that change to be made. But but yeah. on that on that front, Elaine, sorry, I'd love to jump please, in. Please, yeah, actually. please, Kim. Um, I think it's great that we're focusing on you know what's long been the elephant in the room for the wine industry, which is the carbon footprint of glass bottles, which has been one of the largest uh, parts of the the overall carbon footprint. I just want to point out two things. One, that is actually really unusual that packaging forms a large or even substantial part of um, total carbon footprint for agricultural products or for most products. So it is important to have these discussions for the wine industry, but um, maybe just to the second point, return to the, the bigger picture. If we are talking about, you know, the goals from um, the initiative that um, Jackson Family Wines and others have started, which is in line with the science-based targets, it's you have to look at the whole picture. And mm -hmm. so there, if we look at the winery, or rather starting with the vineyard, um, the biggest change there is to look at optimizing inputs and reducing, uh, managing nitrogen. If we look at um, the vineyard, or excuse me, <laughs> Sorry, that was the vineyard. If we look at the winery, energy efficiency and switching to renewable energy are really important. Um, in packaging, lightweight and alternative packaging are really critical. And I would say uh, saving glass for the applications where it's deemed really necessary and making these changes that we're talking about to lightweight and to standardize and make glass more reusable. And that's part of a larger trend that we actually mm -hmm. need to be pushing for of standardizing if we want to have reduce overall consumption and waste we do have to have more standardized products um, to facilitate the kind of circular economy that is already a, a policy goal in europe and then last the transportation part we haven't talked about that much but that's actually a really substantial part of the carbon footprint in the wine industry and that the main thing to do there is to switch from shipping by truck and air to going by rail and uh, ships and working towards making all transportation fossil free. So I just want to put those big pictures in there so we don't, you know, we keep that in mind because what to me is really important about the alliance that um, Julian and others are leading is that it is in line with these science-based targets, mm -hmm. which basically means the industry is doing its fair share to decarbonize in line with the Paris Agreement. And that's kind of addressing this earlier question of, how does what I do matter? How does it connect with the rest of the industry? If if everyone does that and, and does their piece, that is how it adds up. So we have to keep in mind these these bigger pictures too. I, I think that point is so important. We'll talk about it more with the water session as well. Just that um, I think in the wine industry and with wine media, we often get stuck on single questions and act as if that's the solution. And the point of this discussion, and Kim, thank you so for so beautifully pointing that out is we have to be thinking about the systems as a whole glass is one small piece there's a lot of questions that have come in about alternative packaging I think it's important to remember um I think Brian it was you just said that or Julian just said you know no one solution fits all it's like okay yes there are certain markets where wine on tap is a really great idea it works really well for fresh young release wine um, maybe not so much for aging, you know, 20 year old or releasing 20 year old Burgundy, you know, on the other hand, there's, um, there's really brilliant um, cardboard packaging that works well for again, certain kinds of wines like there's um, cans are big perfect for hiking and picnics and things like that. But guess what, they're super vulnerable to heat changes. 
They, um, they don't seem to age well. There's various other challenges um, with pressure questions and things like that. So these alternative packaging um, solutions are really good for specific solutions and wine remain or glass remains a specific solution for other aspects of the wine industry. And so Kim, thanks for pointing that out that we, the goal is to retain glass for where, where it's appropriate. And, and recognize that all these other solutions are, are needed in other ways. And, and with, with the wine industry, thank you for pointing that out. There's what's most effective in the vineyard, what's most effective in the winery, what's most effective in transportation, what's most effective in, you know, effectively in packaging. Um, so Kim, one of the other questions I wanna ask you that came up earlier was um, in the chat was, you know, if we shift gears and talk about the individual level, there's actually, um, we, there are thoroughgoing studies on um, carbon footprint. So it would be effect, essentially it would be the indirect carbon footprint of an individual in relation to our diet, which is another really important aspect of agriculture and food. And, and we actually know what the kind of best carbon neutral um, diet model would be if essentially. Could you talk us through that question as well? Yeah, absolutely. This comes from some of my own research uh, with a former grad student named Seth Wines, where we compiled 39 studies and carbon calculators to identify the high impact personal climate actions for high emitters like myself, uh, who have the option to make different lifestyle choices and reduce our own substantial footprints. What we found there is that transportation is actually the lion's share of high emissions. Uh, for, for high emitters, transportation is, is the biggest piece of the puzzle. So um, the biggest steps that we as individuals can do to reduce our own carbon footprint are to go flight, car, and meat free. Um, myself personally, I've reduced my flying over 90%. I'm a, a former frequent flyer. My, my gold card is now in a museum called Carbon Ruins, which looks back on the bizarre things that we did uh, in the era of uncontrolled climate change, like incentivizing a very climate polluting activity, which flying is. Um, it's much easier to go car free now that I live in Europe than it was in North America and uh, to eliminate meat from my diet. Um, I put in one, an answer to the Q&A, um, a healthy and sustainable diet uh, that meets climate targets and could feed up to 10 billion people doesn't require totally eliminating meat and animal products, but it is about six times less than the average American diet today. So that includes a, a maximum, if you do include animal products, of no more than about two burgers per month. Those would be um, two quarter pound burgers. Two servings per week of fish and chicken. Those are the size of a deck of cards, so pretty modest servings. A couple of eggs per week and a glass of milk per day or equivalently a piece of cheese about the size of your thumb. So having animal products as a highlight for uh, special occasions rather than the centerpiece of a meal, having about half your plate be fruits and vegetables, that's both health and climate and environment recommendations. But in terms of our personal footprints, the biggest impact is first cutting flights and second cutting uh, driving. And I put a link earlier in the chat um, relating to a question about fossil fuel non-proliferation. Mm -hmm. In that newsletter, I highlight some of the research there. And there's a graphic that shows really clearly why uh, food, though we do need to change the way that we eat and consume and produce food, um, and the most important step there being reducing the production and consumption of animal products, it's actually a much bigger bang for the buck for individuals to reduce their transport and starting with flights. Well, and notice how profoundly difficult that is in the United States, which is a great illustration of the need for this to be done jointly through communities. Communities have to be working together to make this possible. You know, it's, it, you really kind of just don't need a car in most of Europe, you know. Um, which which you just pointed out. Um, also, if we could put the link to um, to uh, Dr. Nicholas's uh, newsletter, subscription based newsletter, in the chat again. Thank you. Um, I encourage everybody to sign up for that. Again, you know Kim's writing is brilliantly accessible while still retaining the complexity of the subject. And um, so, anyone that wants to better understand these issues, do consider subscribing to her newsletter and also looking back at previous. Um, installations, a lot of these questions are more thoroughly addressed there. Also, again, Under the Sky We Make, a brilliantly readable book. And one of the things I love that you did that just makes me laugh every time I think about it is at the end of the book, 
there's a section called too long didn't read <laughs> and where yes. it's like let's just be honest um we're not gonna read this whole thing so here's a nice little outline summary of every single chapter you know so um but again i encourage people to read that book as well so um thanks so much yeah one of the um there's there's a few different questions a lot of them we have been addressing in the um in the overall discussion but one of the things that sven from pokura pointed out is that and this is like this is just mind-boggling to me but the transportation of goods by boat across like the pacific or the atlantic is actually the emissions are lower i think i'm reading this right than trucking wine um from between states or countries. So, so one of the things that's that some producers are working on is trying to ensure that wine is being bottled in the region it will be sold. Um, and so as an example, um, Chile um, is a country that does a lot of, they will transport wine in large containers and then bottle it at it, the country of um, destination. So for example, transport wine across the Atlantic um, by boat and then bottle it in the UK would be an example. Uh, and that, that actually lowers um, emissions significantly. Um, and, and so the glass, you know, effectively glass doesn't become part of the equation until it's arrived at the place where it will be sold. So that's something for people to be, um, to be aware of. There's there's initiatives like that happening in, um, in the United States as well, where some of the larger producers create um, glass um, production or bottling lines, uh, again, in a different region so that the, the wine can be transported to that place and bottled on hand. There's a lot of questions though that have come up about alternative packaging. Again, we've addressed these to some extent, but I think we should answer some of them um, more directly. I see who um, just flew from um, Taiwan to Burgundy to get back to work in Burgundy uh, recently. She's actually asking, uh, she says that a producer um, who she interviewed told her that they believe heavier bottles are better for um, aging potential. And so um, are there actually studies on this? Uh, my understanding is that this is not scientifically the case, but um, the three of you are better equipped to answer that question directly than I am. Does the, does the thickness of the glass affect the ageability of the wine inside of it? I am, I am not an expert on that, unfortunately. Uh, I'm not sure. I think there's I only one way to know. No, I mean, I, I don't see, um, I haven't seen evidence for that. There are studies that compare carbon footprint for different packaging solutions, and, and that's why we've been having this conversation about glass because glass does come out as quite heavy in in that regard and we, that's why we've been talking about ways to reduce that impact but uh, in terms of aging potential i don't think that a thicker bottle would yeah. increase aging potential right um you know we knew we do know things like the color of the glass can affect things like light strike but that would be a, a different question um and then i see is also asking um for wines not meant to age so again if we're allowing that glass should be preserved for certain types of needs like aging wine um, when we're considering wines that will be drunk quickly or um, that are simply meant to be uh, sold and consumed in a completely different way. Can anyone comment on kind of the carbon footprint or impact of other types of packaging? Is, is anyone here aware of those? Um, New Belgium Brewery did a really interesting study a few years ago uh, where they compared um, uh, aluminum to glass from a footprint standpoint. And um, their kind of their conclusions were essentially, inconclusive. Um, aluminum has a really, really high uh, footprint associated with smelting um, and mining of aluminum. Um, it's, it's infinitely recyclable, just like glasses as well. And it's lighter, obviously. Um, but I think it speaks to the need, I think, to do more what are known as LCA related studies for all of these various different um, alternative packaging types. Um, so what we do with our greenhouse gas emissions footprint is it's an overarching um, study and, and Kim, I don't know, maybe you can kind of speak to the difference between like an LCA study and a, a high level GHG study, but I think it, it would be behoove us all to get a better understanding of, of where those um, differences are from an individual kind of, uh, if we're talking just specifically on packaging. I mean, the other thing that you need to consider too is, is end of life, right? And so um, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's just so many 
different um, uh, considerations with things like glass versus plastic versus tetrapack versus pulp. Uh, and then, you know, as it relates to fine wine, um, not, not necessarily even just fine wine, but anything that, that is going to be in package for more than six to 12 months. From our own internal studies, what we've seen is, is wine quality tends to deteriorate pretty quickly with these alternative options after about six months. Is that true for bag in a box as well? Do you know? That's something that we haven't talked about. Um, I know that we're doing some studies right now. I haven't, I haven't seen the results of those lately. Yeah. The, um, so Kim did just put a link to a study, a master's thesis that she supervised um, on um, different types of packaging. The one, the one vulnerability that I'm aware of with bag in a box is it, again, it's more susceptible to temperature. Um, yeah. and, and so that ends up being a, a issue with aging as well. Um, yeah. And so, um, you know, with I this, Oh, go ahead. No, I was just, Clark had a question about um, trains versus uh, tractor trailers. And I think that's a really important um, one to, to, to discuss um, as it relates to just product transport. And what we've seen is that um, shipping wine, uh, finished case goods, so bottles and cases via rail is about 80% um, less carbon intensive than over the road. Um, and so again, that's another data point that you wouldn't otherwise know if you weren't calculating your emissions footprint so you get an understanding obviously um you know over the road has a significant footprint and then the biggest one individual like shipping individual wine samples or dtc shipments via two-day fedex uh, air is is uh is, is is a lot um but with rail i think what what we are looking at and what where we see the most opportunity for improvement is you know in how we kind of uh, manage our relationships with our distributor partners and our wholesalers, um, such that, you know, we can, we can ensure that we can, we can ship more wine, uh, via rail. And I think that's something for a West coast based winery, the, the low hanging fruit, the easiest opportunity is to start looking at things West of the Rockies where, um, you just, you have kind of longer transit times and you can, you, you know, that, the, the discrepancies between over the road and, and rail from a timing standpoint are less. Um, but rail is, is one of those levers that you can pull immediately. The challenge being, you know, distributors, wholesalers, they tend to, you know, if your wine doesn't show up when it's supposed to show up, you lose your spot in the, in the queue as it were. Yeah. So, um, Brian, something that's, um, being asked to Clark is, um, asking about furnace of the furnaces for the future again. And just that point that, um, you know, you were talking about how we can lower emissions by shifting the furnaces to rely on renewable energy. Um, you know, and that is again more possible in Europe because there are like the renewable energy grid is is far more robust there, to put it simply. Um, but the technology actually is known. Um, so, could you talk us through again um, how that shift is being made? He's also asking though specifically about hydrogen. You had mentioned it briefly um, uh, when you were talking about about furnaces for the future. And so could you just talk us through the role of hydrogen and, um, and also the role of renewable energy in this eventual goal of creating furnaces for the future? Sure, sure. For the, so for the furnace uh, for the future, we're looking at um, you know, changing the, the furnace structure at a, uh, at a you know, large scale, regular size furnace to be uh, less gas-based in terms of melting the melting the uh, the products together and uh, more uh, electricity-based. So, you know, we would view in Europe, where for, according to the FEVED data, uh, about 60% fewer emissions from 80% less natural gas usage, and 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 using more electricity-based uh, based energy to to uh, to to melt the glass. So that's where we have, um, you know, the real advantage of. You know, can can you still using power to melt the melt the uh, the glass and create the glass? But using that electricity that's coming from a renewable source is where we're really at the at the source of of production, uh, reducing our emissions. So that's uh, that's where we would look. And then hydrogen as 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 a fuel, I think, is uh, going to be the next step. I think the question was more around, you know, in general, where are um, where will hydrogen come from? And I think that that is also a place where as well in. Um, some offshore locations in Europe and and um, 
uh, where Europe is well ahead of the United States. And, and I, I don't know a whole lot about that as an energy source, but um, I, I know it's something that, that is emerging, that is, that is definitely uh, will help reduce fossil fuel uh, consumption across energy in a number of industries and, and how that, that plays off for glass, I think has remained to be seen, um, but it's, it's a tremendous opportunity. Um, so I think that we've addressed the questions in the Q&A. There's been a lot of chat going on, which I always love seeing. It does sometimes mean that I miss some of the questions that are meant to be addressed. But as we start closing, I just would, you know, again, one of the, I think, um, climate paralysis is something that I see a lot. Um, you know, people think, oh my God, this problem is so huge. Um, what can we do? And I was actually um, just in Alaska with my family and my, my sister, even, you know, my, my niece is literally a, um, indigenous climate activist in Alaska. And her mom still says, you know, climate change is so huge. It doesn't matter what any one of us does. This is clearly not true, but, but it's reflective of an attitude I think is very common and, and really gets at that point that sometimes the problem seems so big that it's hard to remember that there's low hanging fruit or easier things that we can do. And so I just thought like to close, I think we should actually focus on what are things each of us can do. One way to answer that question is to ask, okay, each of us as a producer, what can, what's something wine producer can do? Um, each of us as members of the wine trade, what's something wine trade can do? And each of us as members of the wine media, what's something that wine media can do? And so um, Brian, I'd like to ask, you know, you know, but also each of us as individuals or as consumers, what, what can we do? Brian, so what are some of the key top things you would love people to have as takeaways that we can do? Yeah, I would say, you know, recycling is important. And, uh, you know, when you, when you recycle a product and or, you know, make that deposit return that you are helping enable, uh, you know, a lower emissions economy, right? Um, so, so re reuse and recycle is, is extremely important. And I would also say that when you're considering packaging, looking at, you know, the circularity of, 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 what, you are, of what you're purchasing and that, you know, not only is something made out of, you know, recycled material, post-consumer material, but, but how will this be used again, right? And I think that a lot of the decisions that, uh, you know, we need to make are, are materials and uh, packaging where something can be used again and again. And that is where, you know, we're, we're reducing waste. And so I would say, you know, um, uh, recycling is very important and also uh, consider what you're, you know, what you're buying and what it's used for. Thank you. Julian? Um, I, I mean, I think we as wine producers are kind of a, a small part of a larger ecosystem. Um, and it's really important that we, you know, we measure and understand what our impacts are across our, our indirect and our direct um, emissions so that we can take appropriate action, right? So that we can, we can focus on the things that are gonna have the biggest impacts both, both immediately and then over the long-term. And I think as it relates to over the long-term, um, you know, I think a hundred months is, is the time that we have to cut emissions in half. And that's not something that any individual winery, regardless of how big they are or how well-resourced they are, is gonna be able to do alone. So the idea of, of collaborations through organizations like IWCA, I think are really, really powerful levers that we can pull. Um, and then as, I think as human beings, um, you know, it's, it's, it's what Kim was saying is like our, the impacts of our individual actions are really, they matter. Um, and as a, a parent, I have two young children whose first day is today at school. Like to me, you know, we're essentially raising the next generation of consumers. And so I think it's important to talk about these things uh, in, the, in the context within which they exist uh, to the next generation so that they fully understand what's happening. Yeah, thank you. Kim, I wanna close with you. And so because of that, I'm going to offer my suggestions and then ask you to offer yours. And so, um, you know, I want to really put the lens directly aimed at wine media and wine trade. As a member of the wine media and wine trade, I have, you know, I can call us out, okay? The truth is as communicators, um, as buyers, we have incredible leveraging power. You know, what I would like to charge each of you with, with the idea that come up with a climate action article you can write this week. Remember 
every time you are ask about whole cluster technique or what kind of yeast are you using, you actually could do the work to find a way to link that into even a simple comment about climate action or climate change, okay? They, these are the bigger issues and we actually have the ability to increase the conversation. Kim started us off with the simple point that a few of us can change the world, right? A minority of people can change what we see as normal. And so if we all just start finding the links and doing the work to make this part of the forefront of the conversation, it will be the forefront of the conversation. That's what we have to be doing is accelerating this conversation. The trade's ability to do that is to actually ask your suppliers, who can you bring to me that has been reducing their carbon footprint? Who can you bring to me? What wines can you bring to me that have lightweighted their bottles? You can ask these questions. That's your power as a buyer who influences what consumers have access to. So keep those things in mind. Um, our, as wine media and wine trade, we're responsible for the choices we make available to the consumers that depend on us because we are their gatekeepers to their access to information and access to wine. So use your gatekeeping power wisely. Um, it will ultimately serve your business as well. So having said that, Kim, I would love to close with your recommendations. What would you like all of us to know? Thank you, Elaine. Um, I mean, this is my mission. I've kind of gone from a basic researcher to trying to get the word out of who can do what to actually fix the climate crisis and use research to point out what has been shown to be most effective there. So as I mentioned, for individuals, if we're talking about consumers, uh, flight, car, and meat-free, those are the biggest levers. As um, wine consumers, I think being aware of the impact the industry has on the world is really important. We talked about from the production side in the vineyard, it's about nitrogen and input management are the highest impact. It's about energy efficiency and renewable energy in the winery. Uh, Julian mentioned own energy production, solar energy production. We've talked a lot about packaging and the need to reduce uh, the impact of packaging and about transport and the need to shift from flight and roads to rail and ships and the whole system needs to go fossil free. Something we haven't talked too much about is investments and looking at investment portfolios, both in our pensions and any private investments and as a company and divesting those from high carbon in uh, companies. So there are a number of campaigns to do that. You can check out the fossil free campaign, but I think both from a business standpoint and from a, a leverage standpoint, that's really important. Politics is another, I saw that there was a question in the chat we haven't talked too much about, but it is also very important. And one thing we need to realize is that the current policies and politics in place incentivize and make cheaper, unsustainable and even dangerous options. And we know that there has been a long history of disinformation and uh, delay by the fossil fuel industry, which incentivizes and keeps those policies in place. Someone in the chat mentioned Washington state not changing policies. We know from investigative research that that campaign, there was a, a carbon climate action um, on the ballot there that was overturned by the fossil fuel industry. So I think looking at both a rapid shutdown and a fair and just transition from fossil dependent energy systems to clean and renewable energy and fossil free systems that have good jobs and are done in a fair way. That's basically what we need to do. And some of that is political, some of it is investments. I think the media, as you said, plays a really critical role because we know that the media so far has fallen short with some notable exceptions, some of you who are in this group, uh, who are telling the story. But really, at this point in 2021 and going forward, every story is and needs to be told as a climate story. Climate is not some separate issue. It is underlying our ability to have life on Earth, to continue civilization, and certainly to enjoy fine wine. So if media need help uh, in making those connections, I'd be very happy to talk with people about how to tell climate stories through the stories you're writing already. It doesn't mean you have to make big changes, but um, those stories are there. And yeah, I think, um, I think I will end there. Thank you. One of the comments you made to me um, the first time we met was just that a really powerful way to deliver those stories is to personalize them, mm -hmm. you know, to help, help readers see that the climate story is a personal story. It's about saving what you love. 
And I think that's just a really powerful way to put it. Yeah. Um, but thank you for generously offering to help media better understand how to communicate. As a reminder, um, Dr. Nicholas's um, newsletter is a really powerful way to keep up with this insight and information. Um, I want to remind everyone too that this series, we will be addressing these questions and these issues from different angles, essentially, in a way that's all the same, it's all the same challenging issue, right? But we're going to look at it from a different filter, a different angle each time. So on September 14th, starting at the same time as this um, session, we will be looking at basically water systems. A lot of times we talk, we think about water as simply conserving and using less. In actuality, we need to be looking at the entire system of water usage and how that actually affects and informs habitat preservation as well. And then the way that habitat preservation thereby also impacts the carbon cycle. So we'll be talking about that next time. Again, that session is September 14th. Again, I thank you all for being with us today, um, especially to those that were able to stay for the entire session. Please do feel free to email follow-up questions or requests for um, further interviews from any of us if you, if you have those um, needs. And I'm deeply grateful to each of the panelists for making time today behind the scenes um, there's been a whole team of people helping to make this work. So thank you to all of you at Jackson Family for not only sponsoring this session, but making it happen and making it work. And um, huge thanks to Gonzalo Munoz um, for making time before he goes on to um, plan the next um, climate action conference that's coming up soon. Uh, very big thanks to you, Brian, for being willing to kind of speak with transparency and accountability for the work that you're doing with GLASS. Julian, for helping to, you know, really understand um, all of us how, how um, wine companies, winemakers can really make a difference in this way. And Kim, for sharing the, like, making this approachable and understandable. You know, your ability to translate complex information into something understandable is really important. So again, thank you to all of you um, for being here today. And um, hopefully we'll see you again on September 14th. Yeah, thanks, everyone.